So now we have two speakers. First, first speaker is Reo Zenger. He is a uh, former sysadmin who is working at uh, an ISP and through that became interested in uh, civil rights and freedom issues online. And our second speaker is Ott van Dahlen. He's a former attorney and a researcher at the uh, Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. And he is now the director of uh, Bits of Freedom, which was relaunched four years ago at the last Dutch hacker camp. And the two are going to talk about what has happened since then. Please welcome on stage Rea Zenger and Ott van Dahlen. Give it up. So thank you. Um, I remember standing on this platform, or a very similar platform, uh, four years ago. We, um, we were inspired by digital technology and the, and the promise that it brings. The, the possibility to connect people and to empower people, the possibility for innovation. But we also saw the risks, the risks of control, the risks of surveillance and the risks of censorship. And it was with that promise in mind and with, that, with those risks in mind that we relaunched Bits of Freedom four years ago right here or at this similar platform. Since then, a lot has happened and we thought that this was a right, ni nice moment to go back what has happened the last four years and look forward what will happen in the coming four years and what can you do? So, let's first start with um, how it started. In 2009, for me, the sense of urgency was really big. A lot of things were happening at the same time. Data retention law was just being uh, adopted and was to be implemented in the Netherlands, ensuring that every location of every Dutch citizen uh, was stored for a period of one year and that all internet traffic, all internet access and, uh, and emails uh, are, was to be stored for half a year, traffic data. The biometric fingerprints in passports were, uh, were to be introduced, um, also to be stored in a central database. Disconnection laws were uh, high on the agenda of a lot of countries. It started with Adobe in France, it then branched out to the UK, and it was even being discussed in the Netherlands as well. Um, website blocking, voluntary website blocking was another issue which was on the agenda. Um, uh, Dutch ISPs wanted to block, or at least uh, were, were, were pushed into blocking uh, websites uh, with uh, uh, images of sexual child abuse. Uh, the talks around ACTA had just started um, and were already being discussed here at HAR as well. So there was a lot of, uh, there was a sense of urgency. It had to be done now. And we were not the only one who had this sense of urgency. There was like this second wave of digital rights organizations in Europe. First, we had one wave in 2000, 2001, where Privacy International started and where Bits of Freedom in its original form also started. But then in 2009, a lot of new national organizations launched. Uh, Panopticon in Poland started in, Poland started in 2009. Uh, European Digital Rights Initiative uh, uh, had a full-time employee in 2009. La Quadrature started in 2008. Bits of Freedom at that moment started as well. We always thought that it was necessary that we were there, but the extent to which it was necessary re really surprised us. The amount of support we g gained in, in, in a very short time was amazing. And not only that, the media found us um, very quickly as well. And this was for the simple reason that they didn't have a trusted expert, uh, a source to um, counter the, 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 the force of the lobbying forces which were uh, uh, continually pushing for restrictive policies. Um, and not only the media, not only supporters, but also politicians were very much open to our, uh, to our presence. Um, I remember one time emailing Nelly Cruz and, uh, for, for an appointment, and we managed to get an appointment within one week. It was really incredible. Uh, for the simple reason that we were the only one representing interests of internet users. So, 
um, it was, and, and, and I'm sure that the other organizations have the same, same experience. So that was a backdrop of 2009. So what happened then? Yeah, so what happened since uh, 2009 in the last four years? Um, well, uh, we've been uh, struggling hard and we have won a couple of those battles. Uh, for example, um, everybody remembers ACTA, and I uh, remember all the news reports and all the protests of people, thousands of people on the streets, even in, on cold days. Um, people weren't on the streets because they liked those obscure trade agreements, but they were on the streets because they thought internet freedom is important. Um, another example is um, in, the, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, we have seen quite some uh, proposals for uh, blocking access to websites. But most of those proposals, or all of those proposals, do not solve the underlying problem. They only hide it. And we were able to convince uh, the politicians to uh, not agree with such a proposal. And so we don't uh, have uh, such an internet filter in the Netherlands right now. Um, and one other well-known victory in the Netherlands is, of course, net neutrality. Where KPN, uh, the Dutch telco, was very uh, bragging about using DPI in the network, um, uh, people stood up and, d and they started to write about it and um, um, explaining that they didn't like it. They uh, even went to the police to report this and to get the prosecution uh, after KPN. Um, all of this made a lot of fuss and made a lot of um, attraction for the uh, politicians to come up with a solution and have net neutrality enshrined by law. Um, so these are things, these are examples where we have been very successful um, in the Netherlands, but also in Europe. But on the same uh, hand, we have to, on the, on the other hand, we have to say that um, uh, we also have been struggling on a lot of other t uh, issues. Um, Ot already mentioned the data retention. Uh, it, it, w it was there already uh, four years ago, and it's still here. And um, I'm not very optimistic that we have it uh, um, uh, retracted within the next year or so. Um, and it's weird because uh, 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 500 million of Euro Europeans, they are being uh, in the crosshairs of the governments while not being uh, suspected from any wrongdoing. Um, another example um, is the hack proposal in the Netherlands. Um, uh, our Minister of Justice has proposed uh, legislation which, uh, where, they can, uh, where the police can hack into your computer and remove data or install spyware. Um, and all, um, and this legislation has lots of more um, uh, horrible provisions in it, like in a requirement for uh, uh, for your password to, to to hand over your password if they have your encrypted hard disk. Um, and um, internet filters. I already mentioned there were a few proposals in uh, in the Netherlands and Europe in in the past few years, but there's again a new proposal for internet filters in the Netherlands. Uh, this time to uh, block access to um, illegal gambling sites. So there's a lot of um, um, uh, issues going on where we um, still have not been able to make the right change to it. Um, also, I find it very, very um, illustrating that if you uh, look at the program of OHM, um, Google will know about it because there's some um, uh, data uh, stored from, uh, uh, shown in the page from Google. So um, it's very hard to uh, find your way on the internet without being tracked. Um, and then there's one more thing, which uh, personally, I, when I was um, not yet working at Bits of Freedom, I always had this naive idea of we need to win a couple of battles and then we're done. But we definitely were not because if we win the battle and something like net neutrality is enshrined by law, um, we still need to monitor all the developments around it. Um, and now, for example, uh, a European a proposal has leaked uh, which would overrule the Dutch net neutrality. Um, and, will, and if this proposal will pass, then we will lose net neutrality again in the Netherlands. So where I thought in the, um, in the past, it's, it's we need to win some battles and then we're done. That's definitely not true. Um, so it's very um, uh, uh, interesting to analyze this and to have uh, to see what uh, what has changed in those past four years. And um, one thing we notice is that um, uh, uh, politicians have become 
um, uh, aware of the internet. So internet freedom is not only on our agenda, but it's also on theirs. And it's not uh, that they have the same uh, ex uh, description for uh, the, the same definition of internet freedom. So their agenda differs from us while they're using the same um, uh, terms for it. So, um, and also one other thing which is uh, noticeable is that uh, the government uses um, it always to their own end. So internet freedom, um, if, ta if talked about by the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, he will, um, uh, he will uh, notice how important, uh, he, will, he will explain how important internet freedom is, uh, how important internet freedom is for countries with uh, oppressive regimes. But on the other hand, you have Dutch Minister of Justice who um, uh, on the same day <laughs> proposes all kinds of uh, legislation which will break our freedoms. Um, so um, not only uh, governments have become more active on this uh, field, but also uh, uh, some companies um, from like in security companies, they have become much more um, open in the media to talk about it, and this will um, change our, um, uh, this will require a change for us how, how we work. So one thing to notice is that not only politicians have become aware of the internet, but there are more organizations we have to take care uh, about. Um, but not only politicians um, know now about the internet, but also the general public has become more aware. Uh, they have become more aware of all the privacy related issues because there are uh, many security information breaches every day. There are new uh, revelations from Snowden um, uh, regularly. So the, uh, the, the public will um, uh, is become also more aware of what is going on. Um, and this in part uh, is about um, uh, the public is, is concerned about what's happening in, in Egypt or Syria, but sometimes it comes more closer. So if you uh, look at London where they had these uh, riots, then the um, uh, UK government uh, was, was thinking about, okay, if there are riots, then social media are the problem, so we need to shut down the internet or, or access to, the phone, to, uh, to phones. So then, um, not only it's far away, but it's coming closer to people as well. Um, another thing we have noticed is that um, um, where in the past you had an internet where, which it was open um, and where you could easily build alternative um, uh, to an existing uh, feature, um, nowadays that is a lot harder. You have lots of companies uh, well, not a lot. You have some companies which are extremely big and which have created uh, gigantic platforms um, and they have closed it off uh, uh, a lot. So you cannot really build an alternative and start uh, exchanging data with them. And that means that you cannot build an alternative uh, social network, for example, because you will not be able to get the users from the one network to the other. So all those companies which are now kind of monopolies and which have very, very close systems, they are also influencing the way how we can solve issues um, by technological means. Um, and one other thing to notice is that the debate has become much more complex. Um, take for example uh, something we've been working on last year uh, a lot, which is the uh, general data protection in, um, uh, in, in Europe. Um, not uh, it, maybe in the past you could say sometimes okay this is a bad proposal and that's it and this is a good proposal and that's it but now you have to uh, do we through uh, thousands of amendments and you need to examine all of those separately and you need to take a position on all of those separately so it has become a lot more complex to uh, to fight these uh, uh, to issues um, also the government has become more um, um, aware of organizations like Bits of Freedom. Um, so they are really trying to preemptive the debate. They are trying to um, uh, uh, they do their best to have their uh, legislation proposed in a way that people will accept it. Um, so um, uh, they, they try to, um, they have become aware that we are a powerful organization and they're trying to take the power away from us. That's it. Like, um, and this also changes the way we need to play this game because it becomes a lot more uh, a tactical game to play. Um, and also, not only the issues itself become more uh, complex, but also 
um, uh, the surroundings are more complex. You have, uh, we have a world in which we are um, uh, uh, digitizing all the time um, uh, more, and this makes it that if you have a, a view on uh, on cybersecurity, you not only can talk about um, blocking the internet if that's okay or not, but you also need to think about all the other implications around it, uh, which makes uh, fighting these issues a lot more difficult as well. And of course a lot of things is going on, so it's very, very hard to keep up. Now, if you have these in the back of your, in the back of your mind, what, what can you deduce from it? Uh, one thing is that uh, the amount of stakeholders we have to deal with um, are growing, they are, they are increasing. Also, the amount of awareness, uh, both good and bad, is, uh, is rising. Then, uh, the amount of issues um, is rising, and with those issues, the, uh, the amount of complexity is also rising. So, this brings us to an important question: What are we heading for now? Yeah. So, so if you extrapolate those um, those trends, uh, re uh, increasing awareness, increasing complexity, increasing stakeholders, and increasing uh, issues, then um, uh, this this will definitely continue. More companies, more NGOs, more politicians will become involved in this issue. It will not only be a case for the Ministry of Justice, but it will also be a case for the Ministry of Economic Affairs. It will not only be a case for uh, digital rights organizations, but also for Amnesty and for other organizations. And these may, all not, be a, may not all be aligned with, with, with us. Um, secondly, the awareness, as far as we can see, tends to taper off a bit. Um, after the sort of the, the, the 20th data breach, then people say a thing like, well, whatever, what, what can I do about this? And the same goes for the revelations from Snowden. The first time you see this, you're like, this is incredible. And right now, after the seventh or tenth, like, X key score was published, and we were, we, we were also, how, how does it fit into the greater scheme of things? So. Um, uh, uh, people will become a bit tired, we, we guess, about privacy restrictions. On the other hand, it's not like restrictive policies will, will, will not be introduced anymore. We have seen over the past four years that restrictive policies are being proposed, and we think that this will just continue to be, be, be the case, and maybe at a more rapid pace. And lastly, it's just the case, and this is really important, I think that we conclude that digital rights organizations which are currently in the field cannot do it alone. So let me tell you what we do. We do advocacy work. We do, uh, so, so you know, we speak to politicians. We advise them on, uh, you know, how policy w should, be, should be like, what policy should be like. We do uh, campaigning, so we try to mobilize people on our issues. And we do empowerment, so we build uh, websites, tools, which, which, which give people uh, uh, the power to, to, to use the rights they have. Um, but as you can see, we do a lot. We don't do other issues. For example, we don't, do, uh, we don't build real technology. We don't do litigation strategy. Uh, we, don't, um, we're, we, we could be much better at awareness, creating awareness. We don't do research. All in all, this paints a picture of There are many, many issues on a geographical level. We only do the Netherlands. Organizations like Edri, La Quadrature, et cetera, only do part of Europe. There are many more issues apart from internet-related issues, like financial privacy, medical privacy. We don't do those. And uh, 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 apart from that, we don't do all methods. So we don't do litigation, we don't, we, we, we don't do technology. And so, this is where you come in. You often hear at talks like these, you know, you need to support us. We, we are this organization, we cannot do this alone, you need to support us. I think that at the pace we're going in right now, and the direction we're going in right now, that's not a winning strategy. We need to change the strategy from you supporting organizations like Bits of Freedom to you starting organizations like Bits of Freedom or starting your own one-man army. And this is where we want to, um, this is where we want to um, 
uh, this is one what, what we want to discuss in the second half of this talk. What can you do after you walk out of this room to defend digital rights and start your own army, be it a one-man army or a multiple-man army? So um, there are many things you can do. Um, uh, and we will mention a, a couple of them, uh, but it's definitely not an exhaustive list. One thing which we uh, find very, very important all the time, which, which we notice that, that, that is very useful, is um, uh, fact-finding. So a lot of research needs to be done to make our uh, cases very clear to journalists, to politicians. And um, a, lot of those, a lot of research is not done yet. And I'm pretty sure all of you are very, uh, are, are very much in the position to do this research because you have a lot of knowledge on how technology works. For me, for example, I was, um, before I started uh, working at BitFreedom already, I was doing a lot of FOIA requests. A FOIA request, with, which means that you can ask the government to open up documents on a specific policy. Uh, this is very helpful because you can uncover all kinds of uh, policies which are not clear to the public, but by having those documents in your hands, you can show, okay, this is really going on. For example, I did, um, uh, before, before Bitstream already, I was uh, doing FOIA requests on data retention implementation in the Netherlands. We, if I, I got a lot of documents, and uh, those documents were actually on data retention as it was uh, meant by the European Commission, so uh, data retention of uh, telephone data and, uh, and internet data. But we also noticed that in these documents, there were, uh, there were references to storing bank account details. This was completely new. But then we could go to a, a journalist and explain to them what was happening. Uh, there, uh, it was a scoop, became big in the media, and that's when uh, the government, within a few days, had to say, okay, sorry, sorry, we're not gonna do this. So a FOIA, uh, doing a FOIA request is not really, it doesn't really take a lot of time, to do, but it will um, provide you with lots of uh, information on what the government is actually doing. And this will help uh, presenting our cases a lot better. And one other example, you, I just mentioned some, uh, a FOIA request where you, ha where you, can, where you could find really a scoop uh, from uh, inside those documents. But it doesn't have to be that, uh, that way all the time. Um, last week it became well known in the Netherlands that um, the, the tax office uh, was um, uh, looking into the data of parked cars. So you have those, um, uh, uh, if, you, if you park your car, you have to enter the license plate number uh, into the meter, and this will be in a stored in, an, in, a, in, a, in a national database. And they also have um, uh, cars driving around the road with ANPR ca uh, cameras uh, on, on both sides, so these will store this data as well. And although the uh, company who's storing this national database said, okay, we keep those records only for eight weeks, it turned out they were kept for much longer, for years. When I did this research, I only um, was looking um, uh, just a little bit into this national database, and I was mainly focusing on this car that was driving around uh, recording all those uh, license plates. But I handed over to a journalist, and a journalist did some additional um, research, and then he found that the tax office was uh, getting the data of uh, 2012 for all parked cars. So uh, if you do some FOIA requests and you do not find any scoop in it, it is not really a problem. Sometimes it's enough to get uh, the ball rolling, to get something on. So um, again, it doesn't have to be a lot of work. And it's fun because I like it a lot to, to do some work on it and see other people picking it up and making a change from it. Um, so these um, FOIA requests, this will also help you to, um, to uh, make yourself a trusted expert to the media, to journalists. Um, because I'm doing a lot of FOIA requests, I know uh, that some journalists, um, they, they, can, they, they, know to f they, they, they can find me. They know where I am, they know um, what, I'm, what I'm doing, they know uh, they can trust me. So if they have a problem with, um, uh, uh, dig in the digital area, they come to me and ask me on, on help on covering a story. Um, journalists need help um, 
in a, uh, anyway, because they have on, on their on tight schedules, they have deadlines, and it's for them very, very difficult to um, to grasp a, a, a difficult uh, technological problem and to describe this to uh, people who don't have any idea what, what, they, what they're talking about. So they need help in explaining uh, the technical um, 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 uh, the underlying technologies. And uh, this is where you can help as well, because you all, all of you know how technology works, and you know how to explain this. So if, if you can help a journalist in doing so, it will really help. Um, but also, um, you can do, maybe you are interested in, in, for, in, in tracking uh, on the internet using cookies or whatever. Um, if you can do some research and you can uh, prove there's a problem, um, uh, for example, um, uh, two years ago or something, it was shown that if the user deletes the cookie, they were replaced by the flash cookie, so uh, ignoring the user's uh, wish. Um, these types of research will also explain um, uh, the problems uh, very well. Um, and then there's one other thing which I want to mention. Um, if you uh, talk to journalists, you will notice that the journalist always needs to have um, uh, uh, comprehensible examples. Uh, at Bits Freedom, we uh, are struggling with this uh, from time to time. We have, uh, very often, we have a, what I call a smoking gun, but we're lacking the dead bodies. So um, we need, we, we can show there's a problem with some technology or with, or with some law, but it's very hard to find the examples which are uh, showing this, what the problem actually is for, for regular people like my parents or anyone else. So that's where you can help as well. Um, and there's one more thing I want to mention on the, on the FOIA. Um, it doesn't really take a lot of time, but it takes, you need to, um, it, it, it's, it's a long procedure. So uh, maybe it takes one or two hours a week, but you will have to be working on it for like uh, uh, two months or three months. And um, because of this, journalists don't like to do uh, FOIA requests. And if you do so, you can help them a lot. One other thing is um, um, raising awareness. I already mentioned the example of um, that people don't know what actually is going on. And if you, like, like uh, the, the cookies, um, find doing such research and handing it over to a journalist will help um, understanding, will help the understanding of, of regular people for what the problems are, actually are. Um, and becoming this expert, to a, a trusted expert to a journalist, is not very difficult. Uh, it can start out with just um, um, emailing them or twittering um, an explanation for an issue that is at hand. If you notice something is coming up um, uh, uh, on medical dossiers, uh, there's a new proposal made, um, you're the ones who can explain what the impact of such a proposal is, or a uh, hacking proposal, because we understand technology, we can explain to a journalist what is the problem with the police uh, hacking into your computer and possibly delay deleting your data. And uh, so it's very easy, I think, to uh, get in touch with a journalist and to explain what is going on, to, to bring them, um, uh, uh, to help them with the explanation, but also help them with finding the right angle to, uh, to, to attack the story. And um, I can tell you, if you start doing so with small steps, in the end they will find you and they will come to you a lot more often. Um, and also, um, there is um, a lot of campaigning to be done. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, issues going on that could help uh, that people go on the streets and, and start and protesting. And uh, that doesn't take a lot of effort, I think. You, uh, you need to create a website, you need, to, uh, you need to make people enthusiastic about it, you need to mobilize people. Um, and this can be done with uh, fairly limited um, uh, resources as well and may can have uh, a huge uh, effect. Take, for example, ACTA. Uh, without those thousands of people on the streets in Europe, I'm pretty sure um, the outcome was, would have been different. Um, so um, these are just a few examples of things you can do, but there's a lot more you can do. Yeah, so... so Basically, fact-finding and awareness are very easy, uh, low, low-key uh, things which you can do. Uh, another thing which, where there is a huge gap is litigation or, or basically enforcing rights. 
So what we notice is that um, uh, we have these rights, but um, companies can easily uh, ignore them or infringe them because they basically will not be punished for this. So we also need activity on that front, and there are two ways you can do that. The first one is go to a supervisory authority. The government, uh, for example, in the privacy sphere, has a data protection authority, which keeps track of uh, whether companies uh, uh, comply with, with, with privacy laws. Now, say you are to find a breach in uh, whatever, uh, a Facebook app or whatever, and it turns out that they're leaking information and they are uh, misrepresenting what they're collecting or whatever. It's, you can be the one who starts uh, proceedings against this by writing up a detailed report, technical report, and sending a submission of that report to the Data Protection Authority, asking them to pick up the case. And if it's sufficiently informative, it's sufficiently convincing, if it has a high priority on, th on their list, and if you are sufficiently vocal about it, chances are they might even pick it up, for example. And even if they don't, then the media pressure is already great. Uh, for example, you all probably know Europe versus Facebook, which was started basically by one student, a law student, who, uh, did an, uh, uh, who, who submitted a right to access request uh, on his information to, um, to Facebook. He received uh, thousands of pages on paper with all his information. It turned out that Facebook didn't delete all the information they said they deleted. So this uh, was, a, was a huge media opportunity and it made people aware of what Facebook was doing actually in Europe. Um, you need lawyers for this, but don't overestimate this. Maybe you need, uh, maybe you can team up with a friendly uh, law student who wants to help you with writing the, 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 the submission to the Data Protection Authority, but most of it is uh, our technical uh, fact-finding issues, and these are, this is stuff which you can do as a geek as well. Another thing is litigation. This is something where you obviously need lawyers for, but Let's forget about the lawyers. A big part of this, again, is fact-finding and making sure that you have the technical expertise right. And this is where you can make a lot of a difference. Also, organizing litigation, organizing proceedings is a way to uh, make a difference. We see in Austria and Germany, um, there were cases, court cases, against data retention organized by thousands of people and, 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 did, and this ha had an impact, although it wasn't killed yet. So that's one litigation, another is building tools. We have gone through this already. Um, you, you know more about this than we do. Uh, uh, Tor is doing this already, but there's a lot to be done there still, user interface, etc. And if you work at a company, you can help others by sharing information. For example, currently uh, there's a huge debate about wiretapping in the Netherlands. Uh, we just don't know what is going on. It would help immensely if people from a company which, for example, supplies services to, wiretap, uh, to, to wiretappers or which, which, which works at these networks, actually comes to us and tells us how the things work. So, in short, fact-finding, awareness, enforce rights, build tools, and share information. If you really care about this world and want to improve it, then there's not really a good excuse to not do it. Let's think of some of the reasons why you, would, why you wouldn't start uh, an army yourself. So the first one is it takes too much time. That's not true. There's a lot of things you can do which do not take time. For example, FOIA requests take maybe two to four hours a week for a period of two months. Doable, it can be done in your spare time. It doesn't cost any money. Going to a demonstration doesn't uh, take a lot of time either. It doesn't help. That's not true either. We have seen that very small uh, actions like publishing research on flash cookies or whatever can already have a huge impact on making people aware on, 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 on developments. It's too late. It's never too late. For example, if, if, if we are under siege, then the reasons for becoming active are even stronger than before. 
it will not affect me. Well, maybe it will not affect you right now, but it will affect you in the long run. Possibly you'll be able to distance yourself and isolate yourself from monitoring tools and will be able to circumvent censorship. But in the long run, you will just be outlawed and your technologies will be outlawed. And if it is not you, then at least your family and friends who are not as technically uh, aware as you are. So don't do it only for yourself, but also for the circle of friends you, you live in. And lastly, it cannot be done. So four years ago at this stage, we had a plan, basically. We didn't have anything. We wanted to build an organization of, say, six people, <coughs> which could introduce net neutrality, stop web blocking, um, uh, uh, stop surveillance. And right now, we're here. We built this organization. We can do it, and we hope that you will pick up the torch and start building your own army after this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for quick Q&A. Uh, please keep your questions short. If you'd like to talk to the uh, speakers for longer, you can always uh, talk to them afterwards at the Media Cafe. Please. I, I, have, a, I have a suggestion for an uh, army of uh, very simple uh, activities. My experience is that if you want to trans uh, explain internet to somebody who has, who has no clue but has a lot of power and influence, then you have to talk to him or her person to person. So I propose a project which is called Adopt a Politician, and that we, they get buddies which explain to them what's going on, what's behind this basic knowledge Axel has already started that. They, do, they don't want to see and show in public that they have no clue. So, so you have to do it behind the curtains. Okay? Adopt a politician. Yeah, great That's a advice. very good <laughs> suggestion, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this is already, um, uh, it is already done, in, yeah, for example, in Germany. Uh, Digitale Gesellschaft, I think, uh, already has this working. Uh, we don't have this in the Netherlands, or uh, I don't think in, other, in any of the other countries in Europe. So yeah, that's a very good suggestion. So guys, thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering, uh, there are a lot of technologists here, you are also subject matter experts uh, in some uh, directions. How do I get my friends involved who are neither, so who know very little about these subjects, but who do find them important? So. Um well, if, if they find it important, then already you're halfway there. Um, first, we had to struggle with the, you know, I don't, uh, I don't have anything to hide argument, but if they're already past that, then I think you're, uh, you're halfway there. Then just um, uh, doing things together with them is, is a great way to get them involved in, the, in, 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 this, uh, in these activities. I mean, doing stuff together is uh, even more fun than doing it alone, so uh, I think that would be the, the best way to start. And to make it even easier, I think just talking about it already helps. So it makes people aware, it makes people understand what the problem is. So just start talking is already one step, I think. Um, so sitting here in the stand, um, sitting here in the stand, the past days listening to lectures, I'm not too optimistic about our, our freedom. But do you think there will be a time that you can change your name to Bites of Freedom? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm afraid that um, at this at this stage, I don't think it's really relevant to uh, to think about what lies ahead, but more think about what what we are currently in. And I, I share your pessimism about the current state of affairs, um, uh, especially after these revelations of Snowden. I think that uh, there's even more reason to work very hard and and um, ensure that we are going to be uh, called megabytes of freedom. Okay, do we have any more questions? 
Okay. Okay. Think well, we can wrap it up. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. And again, the uh, speakers will be available at the Media Cafe right after this talk. Thank you.